Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing this protein NSEC1 slash MONK18. Okay, right, so I have spent the previous video reminding you of the structure of these trans snare complexes, uh, which dock the synaptic vesicles at the plasma membrane. And they need this protein complexin to associate with these trans snare complexes to stop the trans snare complexes from bringing the two membranes so close together that they actually cause the fusion of the synaptic vesicle with the plasma membrane. So complexin 1 slash 2 is acting as a so-called clamp protein. Right, so now let's talk about syntaxin 1 in a bit more detail. Now I've drawn syntaxin 1 structure very simply here, but actually what we need to do is make it bigger. So if this is our syntaxin 1 protein, what I've actually drawn is I've drawn this membrane spanning region down here, and I've drawn what's known as the snare motif. So this alpha helix, which interacts with the other snare proteins to form the core snare complex, this is what's known as the snare motif. Okay, so this is the snare motif. But actually, there's a bit that comes upstream of this, and basically what you get is another alpha helix forming, and then it folds back on itself like so, and then it folds back again. So you have these three alpha helices all linked together in this sort of way, and this is what's known as the triple helix. Okay, so this is the triple helix of the syntaxin 1 protein. So actually, upstream of this core snare complex formation here, syntaxin 1 actually has a bit sticking out up here. Okay, and this is this triple helix here. So let me try and highlight it. I want it to still be obvious that it's, yes, that's worked just about. Okay, right. So, why is this important? Well, basically, syntaxin 1 can exist in two conformations. It can exist in this conformation here, which is known as the open conformation, and this is the conformation it needs to be in in order to form the core snare complexes. Okay, so this is the open conformation. So in order to interact with the other snare proteins, SNAP25 and syntaxin, oh, sorry, synaptobrevin or VAMP2, okay, it needs to be in this open conformation. However, what it can do is it can also adopt another conformation cunningly called the closed conformation. Okay, and in this case what happens is the triple snare complex bends back over and then what you have is these three alpha helices sitting, have I drawn too many? No, that's right. These three alpha helices sitting alongside the snare motif. I remember the snare motif was an alpha helix and now it's got these other three alpha helices sitting around it too. And this basically mimics the other snare proteins, it mimics these other three alpha helices which were provided by the synaptobrevin 2 slash vamp 2 and the snap 25. So this is the closed conformation. Okay, right. Now, basically we're now going to discuss a protein known as NSEC1 or uh, MONK18 because NSEC1 and MONK18 are going to be very, very important in binding to this closed conformation and stabilizing it, basically. And what NSEC1 slash MONK18 seems to be involved in is trying to help you make syntaxin 1 without forming these snare complexes. So let me explain to you the problem. So, basically, if we draw... Uh, the nucleus of the neuron here. So this is the nucleus of the neuron. Then around the nucleus you have the rough endoplasmic reticulum where proteins are going to be made. Then along from that you have the Golgi apparatus here. So let's draw the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus is this um, organelle consisting of these squashed cisterni which are basically just like pancakes. They're basically vesicles which have been flattened and then stacked on top of one another. And you usually have about seven of these cisterni, like so. So this is the Golgi apparatus. Golgi apparatus. 
Okay, and this here is the endoplasmic reticulum, specifically the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we might put a little R down there, and I'll write its name out in full. Why not? Rough endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Right. Okay, so let me explain to you the problem. When we are making these proteins, when we're making these snare proteins, what we're going to get is we're going to make, let's say, synaptobrevin, um, synaptobrevin um, 2 here. So this is VAMP2 here. Okay. We're going to make SNAP syntaxin 1 as well. And then we're going to make SNAP25. And they're all going to be in here together, basically. So here's syntaxin 1. And I suppose I should now draw it. Well, actually, uh, I'll draw it in its proper way in a moment. We're going to make all three of these snare proteins together. Now, basically, what can happen is if we did nothing, they would form a complex together. They would form a cis snare, core snare complex. Cis meaning on the same side. So what would happen is they'd all associate together in exactly the same way as they all associate here, but this time they'd be in the same membrane. So they would form what is known as a cis core snare complex. So cis means on the same side. So all of the snare proteins in this cis, uh, oh, oops, I've missed the word core out, core snare complex, uh, would be on the same membrane. Okay, so they'd fuse together, well, they'd form this core snare complex. And basically, what would then happen? Because we need, we need these two proteins to go to the plasma membrane, and we need this protein to end up in the synaptic vesicles. So if they all fuse together, are we going to be able to separate them out and send them to different places? No. So we need to stop the formation of these snare core complexes when we've just created the snares. And this is where uh, NSEC1 and MUNK18 slash, slash MUNK18 seems to be important. So basically, what syntaxin 1 is going to do is when it's just been made, it's going to be in this closed conformation. So let me draw the real thing that's going to happen. You're going to have syntaxin 1 that really looks like this rather than this. Okay? And it's going to be in this closed conformation. Okay? And then the protein MUNK18 slash NSEC1 is going to come and bind to this closed conformation and stabilize the closed conformation to stop it opening, basically. Okay, so in, not in orange, because synaptobrevin's in orange. Uh, what colour should I use? Violet pink, I think. Okay, so pink here is the MUNK18 slash NSEC1 protein. And it basically binds to this closed conformation of the, um, of the synaptaxin 1 protein. So this is MUNK18 or NSEC1. Okay, it binds to this... Uh, closed conformation of, syna in, of syntaxin 1 and stops it from going into the open conformation, at least whilst it's going through this secretory pathway. That means that the core snare complexes can't, few, can't form uh, because basically you can't form a core snare complex just between SNAP25 and SNAP to Brevin. They won't form core snare complexes, which means that you can quite happily send these off uh, to separate locations, basically. So that's all good. So, now, what happens with the MUNK18 when you actually want to form these core snare complexes now that you've got the proteins in the appropriate membranes? Okay, well, actually, initially, we just thought that MUNK18 and slash NSEC1 was just involved in stopping syntaxin 1 from being able to form core snare complexes in the membrane, uh, sorry, in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi i.e. to stop them forming uh, core snare complexes before they've been sent to their different locations. Uh, but it appears to be more important than that. It appears to also be very important in actually helping the assembly of the core snare complexes once they're actually in these opposing membranes, so in the formation of these trans core snare complexes. So basically, let's say we've now got the plasma membrane here. Okay, so initially what happens is you've got SNAP25 here, okay, and you've got syntaxin uh, 1 here, okay. 
So let me now draw it with these four alpha helices, three, sorry, this triple helix up here. Now, so basically, uh, Monk 18 has now, is still, in fact, let me draw a picture in between this. So forget this one for now. Let's say we've arrived at the plasma membrane. Okay, here is our syntaxin 1 protein here, with its triple uh, alpha helix folded back against its snare motif here, and still with the Monk 18 protein, or, uh, or NSEC 1 protein, uh, surrounding it. So this is NSEC1 slash Monk18 bound to the closed confirmation of syntaxin 1 there. Okay, so this is what's happened so far. You've got your, um, your uh, NSEC1 Monk18 and syntaxin 1 to the plasma membrane. Now, what is Monk18 seems to be able to do? In fact, can we just agree on one name? Let's, let's go for NSEC1 rather than Monk18. I think NSEC1 is generally more used than Monk18. OK, so what NSEC1 now allows is it allows the confirmation of this um, syntax in 1 now to change. And it allows it to form a complex with uh, the SNAP25. And now what will happen is the Monk18 will just be bound to this triple helix bit up here, okay? So what's happened is the triple helix has unfolded away from the snare motif here, and now the snare motif here is interacting with the SNAP25 snare motifs, the alpha helixes of SNAP25 here. Okay, so let me outline this. This is the snare motif of the syntaxin 1. Here is that same snare motif. No longer is the triple helix up here folded back against the snare motif. So it's now in the open conformation, basically. And the Monk 18, or, sorry, I've forgotten my own um, notation. So NSEC1 is uh, still bound to the syntax in 1, but only to this triple helix up here, basically. So here is NSEC1. Okay, here's the open confirmation of syntaxin 1, and now it's bound to uh, SNAP25. And now, once the SNAP25 and the syntaxin 1 have formed a complex, then the synaptobrevin can come along on its synaptic vesicle and form the transcorsnair complex. And MONK18 seems to be really important in the formation of these uh, transcorsnair complexes between the um, the snare proteins more important than we ever could have thought because if you make a knockout mouse if you take a mouse and you knock out monk 18 then you get absolutely no uh, exocytosis of neurotransmitter whatsoever now if you compare that for instance to like knocking out complexin Complexin produces a drop in exocytosis of neurotransmitter, but it doesn't completely abolish it. Whereas MONK18 or NSEC1, whatever you want to call it, if you knock it out, you get no neurotransmitter release. And so these uh, animals die quickly after birth. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a powerful, um, powerful protein that's very, very important in the formation, we think, of coarsenair complexes. And we don't think the coarsenair complexes will form uh, unless MONK18 is basically bound to the uh, triple helix of syntaxin 1.